What's happening, guys? Welcome to the James Hogan Podcast. I am honored to have my new friend in Tampa, Mr. Glenn Yaney, on the podcast. Glenn, how we doing? Doing great. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. Thanks for coming on. So just for the listening audience, Glenn is a real estate investor, um, father, husband. He's a partner in Vertical Equity Partners, which owns over 550 units, which is a crazy number to an average person, inspiring entrepreneur, current entrepreneur. It just sounds great. So Glenn, we're inspired by you and, and thank you again for coming on the podcast. Yeah. So I, I, the, the number seems large, but it's, it's unbelievable to me as well. So <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. So you had to start somewhere, right? Like everyone starts somewhere. So tell us, I know a little bit about your story, but for the listening audience, and I also started in the restaurant industry, by the way. Yeah. So Tell them, tell people how you got involved with real estate. Yeah. So I started at Red Lobster and I was extremely tired of my job and uh, literally could not save any money. Couldn't figure it out. What I started to do is on every Monday, I took $50 out of my tips from the weekend and I put them into a, a separate bank account that I couldn't get to. And it was like a credit union with one branch or something like that. So I would go to this, I would deposit it, ACH it over to that account. And there was almost, some, it would take me like two or three days to get the money out. It's pretty much the kind of account that I put it into. And, uh, and I saved up a thousand dollars to become a real estate agent. And, uh, well, first I became an insurance agent and then I learned that I didn't want to be an insurance agent pretty quickly. And then I became a, a real estate agent and, uh, I started showing rental. Well, I, once I got into real estate, there was all the institutions were buying up all the houses at the time. So I'd get like a first time home buyer looking for a hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred thousand dollar house at the what time. Two thousand. Just, just for reference. What's that? What year is this for reference? This is uh 2013. Oh, okay. Oh, nice. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I started in 2012, but really started doing real estate in 2013. And and what happened was they, I would show up to these houses and these houses would be gone. Like they would already be under contract, cash offers, close in two weeks and uh, really unable to compete with like an FHA type buyer, the type of people that would even talk to me because I was new at real estate. So right. what I started doing is converting, you know, I talked to these, uh, I'd get there's a bunch of experienced real estate agents in the office and I was new. So all I would do is show rentals. So they would get rental leads and they would send them to me and I would show all the, the leads and became somewhat of an expert of the rentals in the area. Um, in like Wesley chapel, uh, like new Tampa, land of lakes, uh, Florida, and started showing those and, just start uh, accumulating small commissions, but became more knowledgeable on how to show properties. And I ended up getting recruited by a, a larger institution, American Homes for Rent. They they were starting to, they were the second biggest uh, home buyer in the area. And they were paying about a like half month commission. So it'd be between 750 and $1,000 a month. And I was nice. making about $1,500 a week, a month at, red lobster. <laughs> so yeah. I just started putting all my effort to showing these rentals. And, uh, my first month I closed about 15 of them. So my commissions were about 15,000. So I went from $1,500 a month income to 15,000. And, uh, they ended up recruiting me. And, um, the month after that, I, uh, I was on a different commission scale, but I ended up closing 50, uh, rentals in a month. And I was like, number one in the one country. Month. What's that? In one month? Yeah. One month. Yeah. Wow. 50, that's 50 leases, 50 personalities you're dealing with. It's a lot of volume. A lot of, a lot of waiting around in houses, what it was, <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody tells you they're going to be there at one o'clock and it always turns into one thirty, and you're trying to run around. But yeah, I ended up closing about, uh, I closed 50 rentals that month. And uh, out of the whole country, this company was buying about uh, 100 houses per market, 22 markets. And uh, I, I led the mark the country in leasing. Um, and uh, I did that for six months between 35 and 50 leases a month from uh, when I when I started up with that company. So 
It's a pretty good living right there. 35, 50 leases a month. I might yeah. take that right now. <laughs> yeah, I always felt like the other shoe was going to drop. I always thought this is going to end. They're going to fire me. You know, right. I always thought they're going to figure out an easier way to pay somebody, <laughs> pay them less. And uh, so I saved every penny of it. I paid off all my, like I had car debt and, uh, you know, ended up saving a lot of money. And uh, by the end of that six months, there was 10 of us that were running around doing the same thing in our market, the Tampa market. And they ended up uh, firing seven of the 10 and I actually made the cut. So in that meantime, they had a uh, long story short, they had a, uh, those other two agents that made the cut actually quit or got fired also. And I became a, a listing agent over 120 listings and just really focused on <laughs> making sure they're on the market, that they're priced right. And just answering the phone is all I did for three years. You know, you answered every phone call for 120 listings. I was the go-to. I was the, 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 the name and the number on the listing. So they, they called and emailed me and, yeah. And I, I was one of the only agents for three years and then they, we, they built out a system and I worked with that company for nine years and, and socked away. I worked as if I, uh, I worked at Red Lobster. I, I mean, I saved my money as if I were working at Red Lobster. So making about $10,000 a month and living on about $1,500. Wow. That's really smart. How do you, so I was just talking about this with my dad, about my brother. So I am very much an income focused person. Yeah. We're almost trying to make the most amount of income, right? I heard Elon yep. Musk say it once and I was like, that's it. I like that. But my, uh, my brother is very much so he makes good money as well, but he's very much, he's cheap yeah. and I'm cheap. So how do you like, what's the mindset of, of the, the saving money? Like, like, how do you, how do you find like, like I almost feel uncomfortable sometimes when, it's like, oh yeah, of course I'll I'll buy it. Like, do you want to do like the extra of whatever? And I'm just like, sure, of course. Like, there's got to be some some kind of like security with yourself in yeah. being more through. It's it's obviously a smarter way to live, but it's there's something to be said about it. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I definitely made a shift at a certain point that realized that income is important, but uh, like the, one of the most important things because you can expand your life with your income, but. Uh, I also believe in efficiencies. So, you know, kind of like minimalism, it's like yeah. you, okay. So like, here's an example of me being frugal. Uh, I live on whatever on Davis Island, very expensive place to live, but I, you know, to buy a house here, it costs a million dollars. I didn't buy a house. I, I found an apartment, but what I did is I sold my primary, I bought a, I bought a house. And I had some equity. I, I rolled that equity over into like a debt product that paid 15%. And uh, I had 100, 180,000 of equity, rolled it in. And pretty much that, it pays me about $2,000 a month. And that $2,000 a month is equivalent to the same price I pay for my rent where I live now. So amazing. I it's like, I've, I'm always looking for a way to become financially independent and Say like now I might have like literally three to five different sources of income, whether it be like rental property, you know, my, my management income, uh, you know, I have promissory notes that I have out, but I, I have a goal for every single, uh, income to make me financially independent. So right now I have like promissory notes that kind of, I can survive off of those and I have rental income. I could also survive off of that. And then you have the primary income. So it, it turns into where it's like a little game with myself that I'm like, it's like tranches of income. Now, what, how do I become financially independent off of this income here? And then you just put sock the money away and, uh, it makes it easier to save money is what happens. So <laughs> yeah, hundred percent. Because if you have this thing, it's like, all right, I know this comes in for my rent. This comes in for my car. This comes in for our rainy day fund. And yeah. then all of a sudden your active income from your job, you can therefore save and then invest into other things. Definitely. And I would, I would also mention, I, I would imagine a lot of people listening is like wondering how to get started. And I could tell you the way that I got started was I, um, I, I moved out of my primary house and moved into another 
primary. So I had very cheap financing, 5% down. And that my primary where I live, I was able to make some, I got a cash flow of about thousand dollars. So I took my new primary and I said, okay, my new mortgage is like, it was like $1,500. And, but my, my old primary was giving me a thousand. So now my overhead is now $500. So it wasn't like I started buying units. It was like, how do I figure out to make my current property that I'm living at pay for my new property that I'm moving to? And, uh, and that's kind of how I, really got launch, launched into uh, buying rental property is, is from buying my own primary, moving out, making sure before I move in that the rental income would cover it. If I decide to move out, rental income is going to cover it. Rental rates mm -hmm. went up a lot, so it helped me a lot. But at the same time, when I first bought it, I already knew I was going to have three to $500 of cash flow on my primary resident whenever I moved in. That's really smart. And I and I like what you said too about just how you got started in single family. Because yeah. a lot of people, especially these big multifamily investors, they forget where they came from. Yeah. You yeah. Know? So I like that you said that. And I think it's very important for people to just take down the first deal, like buy a piece of real estate. There's so many like brokers I know and things like that that just don't own any real estate. Wholesalers. Yeah. And yep. it drives me kind of nuts because it's like you're – especially wholesales. Cause like you're push, 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 pushing us to buy this, but you don't own, you've never saved up the money, worked at the red lobster, did 30 leases a month and actually bought the property. Yeah. You know what I mean, so I think there's something to be definitely said about just taking down the first one, even if it's a small single family and then making sure that if you move out that, that rent will cover it. You know what I mean? Yeah, and there's always a reason not to buy the property. You'll always have, you'll always find something. Ooh, excuse the, me. The goal is to figure out how to make the deal work. And uh, we have, um, like, I, 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 my, I want to say it was my second property. I almost backed out of because the I was doing like a lease back to the seller, so I he was going to live there for a month after, and mm. we argued over. A fifty dollar. He said he he was going to pay like eleven hundred, and I said no, you're going to pay eleven fifty. And because he didn't want to pay eleven fifty, I almost canceled the whole deal. And if I wouldn't uh -oh. have done that, it was like I I ended up making fifty thousand dollars of equity, but I was going to stop it over fifty dollars. You know, so it's kind of like there's. And then here's another story: is during COVID, we had uh, it was at the beginning of COVID. Everybody's telling us that. Everybody's going to stop paying rent. We're going to go into a depression. Right. And something I learned from my business partner is that he doesn't really watch the news and he just looks for deals. And it's like, you look at a deal and you're like, he bought this building for $400,000. And um, it was one of those things where it was like uh, a piece of crap building. But at the same time, you couldn't build that building for 400,000. So he, he bought the building and, uh, he ended up selling it in two years and made $400,000. But if he would have listened to the noise of the news of COVID, you know, whatever is happening, all these problems that are happening, there's always a problem. There's a new politician coming into office. There's always, you know, the Fed is raising rates. There's always a problem on every deal. And, and there's always somebody telling you that it shouldn't, you shouldn't buy it. And uh, he ended up making 400,000 on that deal. And uh, I, you know, for me, I bought a, a three unit mobile home park, complete disaster, you know, hoarding like the whole, you couldn't see the grass on the, at the park because there was so much trash on all of the units. So I ended up converting that one, uh, you know, just doing three day, seven day notices. And within two, two weeks to a month, they started cleaning up. There was one resident that didn't and almost evicted them but they once they realized they're about to be evicted they actually cleaned up all their stuff and that place i put ten ten thousand dollars down on a ninety thousand dollar property and uh it paid it, at the time it paid me like five hundred dollars a month and uh today i think it pays me about a thousand but at the same time it's 
there's there's two properties that I have that kind of cover all my living expenses. And that was how I left my W-2 job is because I bought these two pretty rough properties, lots of problems, and uh, figured out how to make them work. And uh, they ended up paying, you know, they paid me about four or $5,000 a month after I was done uh, getting them where they needed to be. That's amazing. That's amazing. So, and that's a good segue as well, because, so that's how you got started. So Glenn, we're talking, we're talking about leases, single family homes, but Glenn's got 550 units now. So, so is that how you, is that how you got into the mobile home parks? Like how did yep. that happen? It's such a strange yet very popular in the real estate community asset class. Like yeah. how did you get involved with it? It is every, a, it, it's every very hard. I talk to is always mobile home park, mobile home park, Brandon Turner, mobile home park. It's like, yeah, it's a, it's there. It's not exactly easy to get into, which kind of makes it a good asset and they're not making any more of them. So it makes it to where um, it's an asset that uh, kind of tracks land values is what I would say. It, it tracks land values, but also it pays you to hold the land. So you're like those, that three unit park, um, you know, it, as long as that location starts to become dent, more denser or they start developing more in that area, it's like paying me to hold the property. And that's all that, that I, the way I look at it. And that's almost with all of our properties we buy it, and it's a selling point on inflation and everything. So really what, I guess the way we got into it is, um, we bought a 25 unit, we, my partner that the one that bought the warehouse for four hundred thousand that sold it for eight, he um he Let me actually see if I can share my screen on this. I I, oh, I can. Wait, wrong screen. Don't <laughs> hold on. Oh no, I can't even do it. I'm gonna stop sharing. It's all right because I I have you guys up on my other screen right now. So Garrett Smith is your partner, right? Garrett Smith is my partner. Yeah. Nice. Okay. Yeah. So so go ahead. Yeah, so he um, he had a couple. He had probably like a twenty unit portfolio when I was buying my three units, <laughs> and um, I have a friend. I had a, a so I found okay. Actually, I'll I'll go into how I found okay. So the guy that I was introduced to uh, with mobile homes, he was leasing a house for his uh, ex wife is what he was doing, and he ended up. Um, reaching out, you know, I, I called him like every single day. I'm like, this guy's, he, he his uh, ex-wife was trying to lease this house that we couldn't lease. We couldn't figure out how to get it leased. And this house just happened to be down the street from his house. So he was like, I'm going to lease this house. And uh, so anyways, I'm calling this guy and he's like, not, he, hey man, call me back tomorrow. Call me back tomorrow. And I just kept calling him. And then I'm like, I don't know if this, you know, you couldn't tell if he was full of it or not. So anyways, I, uh, he ends up uh, coming in with all of his bank statements. Cause I'm like, Hey, we need your bank statements to get him qualified. And he comes in he didn't want to email them to me. So he came in and then I actually look at his bank statements and he's showing, you know, I think he was making a 60,000 a month, which is the most I've ever seen when I was showing rentals. I mean, I'd look at income all day and I was like, this guy's making $60,000 a month and he's leasing a house anyway. So he ends up, um, we end up trying to run him, and he ends up getting denied on the application <laughs> and I get denied background. His background didn't uh, qualify him. So long story <laughs> short, I, I just, I'm like, I need to call this guy. Like he actually knows something I don't. He's making sixty thousand dollars a month, so I start calling him and uh, talking to him regularly about mobile homes. And uh, we ended up, yeah, we ended up getting the deal done through somebody else. But she, but uh, long story short, me and this guy became friends. And uh, I had another friend that had ten thousand units at the time. Dang. And, yeah. So he, I wanted to introduce the two of them. And they're in the middle of a lawsuit against each other. And I didn't know it. So I end up. Oh, my introduced. God. That's so funny. You're like, oh, I know this guy. You should definitely meet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be sued by him. <laughs> they're in the middle of suing each other and uh, uh, went to lunch with them together. And they're like, no. it was just so uncomfortable. Oof. Would you bring them on like a blind date? Like, oh, I have not a date. Obviously. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I want you to meet my friend. 
who's in the same business, maybe we could do something together. Yeah, I'm just like connecting people. I'm not, you know, just like you and me, I'd connect you with somebody else. Like, hey, I know somebody that flipping houses down the street that does wholesaling. You know, maybe you guys have something you guys could work each other. Yeah, you know, work out a deal. You 100%. Know? Yeah, no, I'm meeting another flipper um, in St. Pete in like an hour. So I, I know what you're saying. I, I believe me, I get what you're saying. Yeah, so that's so yeah. funny. Though. And then they show up. And... <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. You but those cut, two guys, those two guys really showed knife. me, they kind of showed me the ropes. So those, those two guys, they kind of, and, and Garrett as well. Like these, there are different tiers of pe of uh, real estate investor. You had Garrett had 20 units. You had uh, the mobile home guy. He had about 600 at the time. And then you had uh, Randy with, with 10,000 and uh, all of them different levels of knowledge, but all of them very well. Like talk about focusing on income. That's their main thing. They focused on income. They uh, didn't watch the news. Well, Randy would watch the news more of like Fox News, but uh, yeah. they they didn't worry about like CNBC on what what's happening with uh, the euro or what's happening with mm -hmm. uh, you know the stock market. Didn't matter, to, like, them. Didn't matter to them. They're just focused on their lane and doing it to the best of their ability. Find a deal is what they would say. Find a deal. I love it. That's what I do. I, that's yeah. all I do is I find deals. I made, I think, five offers today on just whoever's fine. I'm direct to seller on one, broker, wholesaler, whatever. That's, that's what I do, man. The money will follow. That's for sure. That's the plan. I'll talk to you about this more because this is a podcast about you, but we're doing a call center. We talked about that. I'm actually interviewing for that today and tomorrow. Then and we have all the systems, so that's going to be something really cool, cool happening. But um, but that's for single family fixing, like on the re more on the retail side of things. Yeah, you know. But the goal is to get into multifamily. The goal is to get into mobile home parks. I really like self storage. So you know why why mobile home parks specifically? I I think the reason is is because uh, apartments are very popular and. Uh, way easier to finance. So the cash flows are not as good. But if you can figure out the private financing aspect of it, uh, you can buy mobile home parks all day long. And that's kind of what we did. We have private money. We um, we started small. The first loan that this private lender wrote us was like a $30,000 mortgage. Or it was to Garrett. And uh, over time, uh, it's gone up since then, you know, it's been, you know, the same guy that wrote a 30,000 mortgage was a million dollar mortgage. So that's great. Well, so. that, that, that's, that's a testament to your guys investing. That's, I mean, that's the best compliment you could get. Yeah. Is and that people want to work with you in the future? Yeah, it's definitely, I would say also for the, anybody that's new or in the middle of doing this, uh, there's definitely stress that comes with all of it and it, it's not for free. But I would say that um, the reward is is it pays off, and I would say that uh, you know it's nothing's perfect. Not one deal is perfect. Everything's got hair on it. If it was perfect, it would be expensive and not worth buying. You know, you have to find the deals that don't that most people look at it and say, "I'm not going to buy that," and they're like, "That's the one I want." <laughs> like, mm -hmm. there's a reason why the seller's selling it for below the market. You know. I mean, maybe the market will shift to where you can buy like A class properties for cheap, but right now there's so much money out there that you you have to find ways to add value. And uh, the key to value add is to um, you're working in your, uh, you know, you're working in the value, the equity. You're you're boosting the equity through, uh, you know, increasing revenues, changing the way the structure of the deal is, you know. Um, making it financeable, you know, make it like with single family homes, the key to selling a, a, a great deal is buy a house that's unfinanceable and make it financeable, you know, make it an FHA financeable house and you'll sell it for way more than what you paid for it. So hundred percent. Yeah. So I, I know I really haven't talked about mobile homes, but I, I would say we, we really focused on, um, you know, we've learned that, um, you know, selling the mobile homes off, is uh the key to a successful mobile home park along with financing you you're you do seller not, financing back to them when you sell it yeah like rent to own or you can find them uh or you can 
there's a lot of since housing affordability is such a big deal there's people that pay cash we just like um we'll have people show up with twenty thousand dollars just to pay lot rent you know so we'll buy these mobile homes and and then sell them for between 15 and twenty five thousand, and and uh there's people that have cash and they'll pay it and it's just uh extra revenue for the park you have this twenty five thousand influx of cash you can take it and put it back into the park or you can, uh, you know, roll it into another deal. That's amazing. And then they still have to pay that lot rent always, no matter what. Yeah. So you kind of look at the lot rent as like an HOA fee. And um, if you're ideally, you can constantly improve the park and the longer you own them, the nicer the park will get. We have, so the, what we call ours is like vertical equity parks, you know, one, and we're up to like, right now, I think we're up to 15, you know, vertical equity parks, 15. And um, long story short, uh, you know, one is like, like, I don't even think about that park anymore, but it was a dumpster fire when we bought it, you know, and, uh, you know, 15, vertical equity parks, 15 is like a mess, you know, and it's yeah. like, we're, well, we're working through got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now, do you, you're not dealing with 550 tenants on your own, I imagine, right? No. And that that's, we, my background with property management, that was kind of how I worked in a deal with Garrett, you know, uh, Garrett was, God, that makes sense. Garrett was the, the deal maker, kind of like you, it seems like you're like, seemed like a deal maker. And then, and then there's a guy for operations in the back. So I'm more of the guy that just kind of picks up the scraps, put it together, make sure that there's a chain of command, communication, uh, documentation for everything that we do. And uh, that way we can go through and uh, put thing, put put systems in place to continuously move forward. You know, you can't, for me to manage this on my own, we would have only bought like a hundred units. <laughs> you know, we would have stopped yeah. there because it would have been too much to do anymore. A hundred percent. You need, you need people because if you're running a one man show, it becomes... First of all, it's not a business. Second of all, it becomes impossible to deal with the amount of phone calls, texts, things like that. You can't do it. And if you have a deal finder, you need a person like you, you know, yeah. and you guys complement each other and make a great team. Yeah. You know, and teams are so key to going, you know, my partner always says, we'll go farther, to, farther together, farther, quicker together. Yep. And I couldn't agree more. Even like I was meeting with people yesterday and you know, everyone wants to get into real estate investing. Like people will start to, I mean, not that people are throwing money at me or, and I'm, and you seem to, you, you're raising money. I mean, you have 550 units. I don't yeah. You know. Yeah. So, but, uh, but I've had a pretty easy time raising money and um, everyone wants to get in. But I'm still like, no, I'm sticking with my partner. Although I make half of what I could make, we have a good thing going. We're like-minded it's working. It's working. So it's, and we, we compliment, we have certain, I have certain strengths. He might not have, he has certain strengths. I, I don't might not have, you know what I mean? So, and in turn, like we have another closing today, I'm going to St. Pete to sign papers today and we're making offers. Like it's, it's, it's thriving, you know? Definitely. Yeah. And something to add to that and something that I've learned over time. And I, I know, you know, with, I listen, I love Ryan Pineda and he talks about, uh, Oh yeah. He's good. You know, getting your income up before you really buy into rental properties. And I think he said, first you need to get to $250,000 a year income. And then he said, and don't do anything else until you get to a million dollars total income over time. And then you can start to create something else outside of that. And that's, you know, that income is so important. So if it's like, if you're buying a rental property, it's like, uh, it's like you're you're putting up all this money to make a couple hundred dollars, you know, and how long did it take you to save that, you know, 50,000 or $100,000? You have to get the income up to be able to save the $100,000 more often compared to uh trying to you know, cash flow 200 bucks a, a month, you know. So yeah. it, it the income is uh very important. Yeah. No, I agree and that's why so I told you we put a 14 unit into contract, right? Yeah. We actually backed out of that deal. And yeah. I'll tell you why. One, I mean, we could have done it, but 
One, it was they weren't giving us, they weren't verifying the expenses, right? So they weren't, like we weren't getting sent. It was all in like an Excel sheet, which is great, but I'm like, I need to see a tax return or a re receipt or something. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you could you could have told me anything. Yeah. We weren't getting it to us. We had money lined up. I had a, I was raising capital. Like the, before I met you the first day, I was raising capital for that like all day long that, that past week, you know? Yeah. So it was like, oh my God, you know? But um, anyway, we backed out on it because of that and the fact that we want to perfect the retail side of things with the call center going direct to seller, with the brokerage office that we're opening up, with the lender sponsoring that brokerage office that we're opening up and title. Well, they, they can't do that, but, um, you know, so all the call center, the realtors, I'm getting out of realtor production into just investing production and then advertising. And then once we're doing that and we have a whole machine rolling, then we're going to take our own capital and investor capital and start rolling into multifamily. But like yeah. you said, I think it's focusing on the income now and focusing on, you know, mastering one thing before we go into that, you know? I would tell you that when you first initially told me, it was the first time I met you, so I couldn't give you much feedback. I was just like, I'm just going to listen. Yeah. But I also think with a deal like that, uh, it sound to me that it was too small. And uh, that's, a, that's what every lender said. It's too small, too far away, too muddy. It would be mm -hmm. fine if it was down the street from you. If it mm -hmm. was down the street, you don't, because the problem is, is whoever you're hiring especially if you don't have your own structure in that location, they're going to steal from you. Like mm. it, whether it's time or money or whatever, why, you know, lie to you about something. And that, that was my first thought when you said, you know, what was it? 13 units in Mississippi. It's like, yeah, 14. I could yeah. see that being a, a mess. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we buy, we buy stuff like that. If it was in Tampa, I would be all over it. But oh, what yeah. I would say is, when it's getting on a plane, you think about the revenue. It's like, we'll just say the revenue is, we'll just say 13,000. There's not enough revenue to get you on the plane to go fly there. You know, you're not going to drive there. So you're going to fly there. And now you're sitting on a plane, spending a whole day out there. And if you wanted the property to reimburse you, you pretty much ate all the profits away. So it has to be a larger property to be that far away compared to what we that's kind of like our little niche is like we buy like smaller mobile home parks but we have like 550 in the area so we can buy like a bunch of little ones and then just attach it like as if it were a mo like a apartment added on to the unit count and that's why we why we've kind of focused on the Tampa metro area is because when you get to that 50 to 100 unit count you start competing with the guys that are out of state. Now we're competing mm -hmm. with a couple smaller operators. Texas people buying in Florida. It's a landlord friendly state. It's booming. Yeah. You know? That makes sense. Yep. And that yep. was kind of our thought too, was with the multifamily was like, we're bigger than your mom and pop investor buying like one or two rental properties, but we're smaller than your institutional investor. So that was kind of the thought behind it. With There's that a guy down the street from you. Uh, he, he told me, he said, er, he, this guy, probably the, one of the richest people I've met in, uh, in, uh, uh, real estate. And he said that he sticks to single family homes because every multifamily deal he's ever done, he's lost money and he has 600, 600 houses and, uh, Man. 600 houses in Florida. So. And I think he was he was telling me that he didn't have any debt, which is mind blowing and no more partners. He paid off all his partners. He's big into flipping houses. And he said, you want to know the thing? He, he told me this. He said, just stick to what you know. You don't have to go any further. Than, he's like, don't feel like you are pressured to go do like what everybody at Grant Cardone is doing. You don't have to do that. We're, we can... You can or make Glenn money all, in all types of. I like Glenn Haney. I see five hundred fifty units. I'm like, damn! I got, I got to, I got to get five hundred fifty one. You know, it's okay. just, it, you know what I mean. It's nothing. Per, it's just how I'm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, it's a character defect. You know what I mean? It's just, it's how I am. I'm just like, it's just how I am. You know what I mean? So that's a really good point. Maybe I should just stick to 
what I know and what I love, which is the retail side of real estate and flipping, listing, having people list my flips, stuff like that, because there's a lot of money to be made in it. And then owning single family rentals. The thing also, uh, Alex Hermosi says is, you know, if there's somebody making a billion dollars on in, in your industry, which there is, then what makes you think, why do you have to change your, your model? You just need to make it better every day. Like you just always have to make it better. And, uh, you know, it, there's people that make a ton of money flipping houses, holding single family homes. There's billion, there's institutional money chasing after single family homes. And I'm not saying that, you know, once you have the system, why would you have to stop that business and create a new business? You have yeah. what you have right now. You, you have something that I can't, I wouldn't go out and create. It's impo like for me, it just racks my mind, but at the same time, it's like you have a system in place. Yeah. So it's just, it's just, it's just ambition to a fault. Really. It's just like, you see the shiny, shiny object and you're like, wow, yeah, we shiny get 500 object. units in one deal. And it's like, even I had to call the lender. They're like, we'll do 80%. And that's like, oh, we only got to raise 20. That's 600 K. I raised 300 for a flip. That's two people. And you, you know what? That's how it happens. You know what I mean? That's, that's exactly how it happens actually. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, it's a deal junkie. <laughs> yeah. A little bit. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, yeah. just how, it's just how I am. And even with like listings, it was like, I, I, um, you know, I was doing really well. I won this award, like top 20 under 40. And I'm not saying this to brag at all. I'm just saying it was a matter of fact thing, but it was like, I would still be pissed because I'd be like, well, he got that one listing over me and he's making more and he thinks he's cooler than me. And I would just like, it was just, just never satisfied, you know, never satisfied in the, in the game of business. And that's why that's part of the reason why I love it. I mean, real estate truly changed my life and I, I, I like live for it. I live and breathe it, you know? So yep. it's, it's, it's a passion. You, you know how it is. Definitely. I yeah. can't imagine. A, it's like, I can't imagine going back to the W2 nine to five, you know, oh, definitely not. Definitely not. Well, that was a cool little uh, turn we took. Um, so another question about the mobile home parks, even though now I'm dead set, you see how impressionable I am. <laughs> now yeah. I'm like <laughs> dead set. So, you know, so, I am still interested in mobile home parks, just about, just as an educational thing. So I always love to keep learning. I'm never going to say I'm the smartest guy in the room, um, unless in some rooms, actually. But <laughs> but um, so what's it like? A lot of people talk about like park owned versus um, like residential owned. What do you what do you guys look for? Do you guys want to see park owned homes, or do you want to you want to take the park owned homes and then? That, that's opportunity to sell them off to people. Like what's your thoughts about that? Yeah. Right now we we like to buy park owned home parks. They are not really financeable so we can get them for a cheap price and we can sell those mobile homes off to lower our overall basis to Cause you guys will hold the note. So like Fannie yeah. Freddie obviously doesn't have to get involved. It's not no FHA loans on those, obviously. Well, I would say, what I would know that, yeah, they're not going to go through that, but I would say the one thing we would do is uh, you want to have a short-term note because you want to refinance. Cause if you go to like, I could say, let's do a five-year loan or five-year uh, rent to own contract. But the problem behind that is that when you go to refinance, if you have all these rent to owns still on your, on your books, they're going to want insurance on those mobile homes. So there's, there's, there are ways around it, but if it's, if it's every single home in your neighborhood or in your, your mobile home park, you're going to have to have insurance on those mobile homes. Cause that's where majority of your income is coming from is from these mobile homes rent to owns. And, uh, so the key is to get them off your books. Uh, and what I would also say, and this is the this is the limiting belief that stopped us from growing, and and we kind of turned to, we've actually bought two hundred thirty eight how two two hundred thirty eight units within six months this past six months, and wow. uh, and I didn't even wow. realize it. I just happened to look back and then count it just like last week, and I was like two hundred thirty eight units. It's like we doubled our portfolio after we figured this out, and it was. Um, that lot rents are really a, um, are not to their max potential because everything's owned by mom and pop owners. 
So you have to look at it as um, affordable housing is in such high demand that yes, we have not discovered what the real lot rents are to these mobile homes. And uh, that's why we started backing out our way and not really worrying about the purchase price of the rent to own contract. We look, we, we focus more on the lot rent. So mm. like the lot rent might be 500, but if you look at the market, it could be, you know, like in my mind, it used to be 500, but I, we found out that maybe we could charge 750 or 850 a month lot rent. Wow. And then that, that that's a huge would, increase, even though it doesn't sound like much. Yeah. But it would drive down the value of the mobile homes. So you can sell these mobile homes for like 10 grand. But if I had the lot rents at 500, I could sell them for 30 grand. But to me, it's worth more to just have the lot rents because the bank is going to look at the valuation of uh, land values are uh, the cap rates are smaller. So if you're getting your revenue from lot rent compared to park owned home rent, they're going to give you a compare it from a six cap to a 10 cap, a 10 cap being a park owned home and a six cap being a lot. So you're actually getting the same value uh, of, of the property without the liability of the maintenance of the roofs, the ACs, mm -hmm. refrigerators going out, uh, you know, floors, you know, being redone. It's just, it's, it's, you just pretty much remove the liability of the property is what you're doing when you sell the mobile homes. See, that sounds intriguing to me. Yeah. You know, it, I like that idea because it's, you know, I mean, you're not, you're not dealing with it. Yeah, I'll have to show you some of our parks. We should go out there. It's there's we have one close to Seminole Heights and it's uh it's you know, it's it's uh it's it's pretty wild. It's but we're Should I bring a gun or are they are they good? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. I don't have a gun. <laughs> what I would say is that most of our investors that when we bring them out to the parks for the first time, they're all nervous and I'm like always in the park. So it it's like these are people that are literally just trying, you know, they're they're living just trying to live and we we created a, a a safe functional neighborhood and a lot of times that these parks we're buying them from is uh slum lords so mm -hmm. we we make them to where you know we re-asphalt the roads we might replace the fence to pvc uh re redo the wells the septic tanks and uh yeah so it's not all like 100 percent profit but we we have to get these you know, we have to make it a livable space for people to pay the price we want to pay. So. Yeah. And then, you know, that was something my partner and I talked about as well. And that's why we named our, the capital thing is called impact because, you know, if you can actually give these people, you know, there's a stereotype. When I think of like a mobile home park, I think of like the movie eight mile, right. Yeah. With Eminem, you know what I mean? Uh -huh. So there's a stereotype there, but if you can give people a great place to live and it's affordable and you can make it nice for them and even sell it back to them. So there's pride and home ownership, stuff like that. You can build, you know, you can actually truly help people if they went from like a slumlord to you guys, you guys can help people impact them in their lives as well. You know, definitely. And they, uh, the people that buy our mobile homes are excited. They want to dress up the house, do all this stuff, but, and, um, they, they, they make the community better. And, and also, you know, they home ownership, you know, pride of home ownership is what they, what happens. Exactly. Exactly. It's such a real thing. And I love it, you know, coming from, you know, the real estate agent side of things, it, you know, although my views have changed, have changed, they have oh, about if, if a single family home is an asset or a liability, um, I, I do believe it is a liability, but that being said, there is something to be said about owning your home just in the whole, just, I mean, that's a whole different conversation, but yes, it, it's, it's very, very true. So, um, anyway, no, I learned a lot. That was great. Um, so what's the goals now going forward? You got 550, you got to hit a thousand. Like what's, what's the goal going forward? Like what's, what's the next move? You got to hit a thousand. Come on. What I would say, yeah, a thousand is definitely the goal, but I would say that, um, there's a, just like what you were talking about being a deal junkie and, and we, we love to do deals. We want to buy more, but at the same time, it, we got to remember why we're, why we're doing this. And, um, 
to really just enjoy the moment for what it is. And I have, mm. you know, young kids and, and, uh, what I would say is when we're buying deals, it's stressful. And when we're, you know, when I'm managing them, it's, it's a lot easier is what it comes down to. So we're probably, we're, we plan on buying more of course, but, um, you know, just really focusing on the operations and, uh, picking the right deals is the key. If you, um, you never lose sleep over a deal you didn't do, but you'll lose sleep over a bad deal you've done. And, uh, yeah, that's Pretty something close. that, um, you know, I, I, we looked at a park that was on the border of Georgia and Florida just recently. And, um, uh, we pretty much, it was, it probably would have cash flowed like crazy, probably better than any of our parks. But we looked at it and said, look, we got, you know, we like to be home at night. We don't want to get on a plane to go or plane or, or drive for six hours. It's like, what are we, what are we trying to accomplish here buying this park? That's, that's three, three to six hours away. And, um, you know, today I, I am grateful that I don't have to pick this, buy this park to make sure that I can pay my bills. You know, I'm, I'm, we're okay. We're, we're slowly buying. I think we'll get to a point where we get to a thousand units and we can have the infrastructure to pay, um, very qualified people to help us operate our, uh, you know, further away parks. But for now, we're just trying to focus on making deals happen nearby. That's very, very wise of you to say, too, because everyone gets into real estate investing for financial freedom. Yeah. And if you're like me, you end up becoming a deal junkie obsessed with it to the point where you're pulling your hair out. You you don't have a minute to breathe. And like you said, you forget why you got into it for the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Very wise statement right there. A lot of people lose sight of that, especially people that are going to be listening to this podcast, you know, because, uh, you know, they're starting maybe there now, maybe now finally making the, the couple six figures and, you know, they're going to want to, you know, so that's very wise, very wise statement right there. So, so this has been great. Um, I mean, we talked about everything. Um, oh, last one, last question. So when you guys have the parks, right, you syndicate the funds, you buy them. Now, the three to five year strategy is like, you know, you hold them three to five years and then you want to hit it with a refi. What does that look like? Like, like, are you refining, paying, getting the investors out? You guys keep the asset or you refi just because it's worth more now. And then, you know, so you can take some money out and then still get the cash flow. Like, what is the exit strategy? Yeah, so we are long term believers in mobile home parks. We believe that um, there's very few being built, like new construction. And uh, the price of mobile home parks are going to continuously rise through uh, affordability issues. 100%. So, I agree yeah. with that wholeheartedly. So we do have like kind of like, you know, if we have like a cash out uh, refinance that uh, happens, we do give the partner an option to take the buyout and say, hey, if you, if you want, you can have your money. Because when we first started, we said these are three to five year term of the of the deal. Now we kind of look at it as like, we know how hard they are to find. So we we like to hold them almost like a roll up. So like, say like one day we have 2000 units and uh, these institutions that are buying mobile home parks are gonna run out of hundred unit parks to buy because they're all um, in the wheelhouse of REITs and stuff like that. So right. I think that they'll slowly press down into this uh, the lower unit counts. And if we have like a 2000 unit portfolio, I think that um, the the REITs will pay a premium for it because we did all the heavy lifting of finding uh, the smaller parks all in one area. We're buying them all in one area and uh, it makes it easier to manage for those other parks. And that would be the goal is a, like a roll up. Interesting. So you'd sell off like it, it long-term you sell off the whole portfolio to a REIT, like the whole 2000 you're saying. Yeah, that, that would be ideal or just, or just, or just live off of the, the income, Cash you flow? know, you just never yeah. know. That would be, that would be pretty sick. I, I don't know too much about the whole re once, once I start hearing about REITs and stuff, I, I, you know, I get a little lost. Not, not with that. I get what you just said, because yeah. like you said, they'll pay a premium. I get that. 
but I know I have one buddy who's like a hedge fund guy and he starts talking to that. They, they, he's the one who's into self-storage, right? Yeah. I like self-storage because I've dealt with tenants in the past and I've just, there's such a pain in my ass. So it's like, I feel like, oh, it's just no tenants. That'll work better, right? But then you start talking about, you know, you know, REITs and this, that, waterfall splits, which I, under, I understand all of that part of it. It's just, I don't know. I just, I just, I'm just staying in my lane for right now and educating myself more on, on things. Does that make sense? I think you'll make a lot of money selling single family homes. And it, you're, it, the one guy I know, it's one of the richest guys I know is only buys single family homes and he's killing it. So you just find what I would say is find your wheelhouse and stick to it and make it more efficient, build out the systems. And mm -hmm. I think the money just follows is what will happen. So, yeah, I hope so. That's the plan, you know, because I don't know if you know this, but I was, I mean, I have told you about it a little bit, but you know, I, I, you know, and, and I'll end it with this. I won't keep you for too long. So I got you for an hour and I appreciate your time, by the way. Yeah. Thank you in the middle of the day. But, um, you know, I, a lot of people told me I was crazy moving to Tampa. First of all, I had spent about an hour in Tampa my entire life. <laughs> Looking at apartments that one day. Second off, it was because, but I was just like watching YouTube videos online. I was, I was a pretty well-known, I was a well-known real estate agent in Long Island. Like I, everything was fine. Like nothing bad was happening. And um, I took this humongous jump, like I literally moved with my fiance, our two dogs into a seven, from a five bedroom house to a 700 square foot apartment and literally did this all in no plan B. And, um, and now all the, the plans are unfolding. I mean, we're involved, we're closing on, I think our fifth flip tomorrow or our fourth tomorrow since I've been here, which is like middle of May. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting stuff. And now the troop with the, with the call center happening and with the brokerage office happening, either downtown or Hyde park, I got connected with a great, um, with a great commercial agent and, um, it's just so exciting, man. It's so cool. It's so fun. So I appreciate you saying the, the kind words and congrats on your success as well, because 550 units is like super impressive. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's definitely, uh, it's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> I got nothing to say. Yeah. It's, it's, so it's a lot of work. And I could tell you that, um, it, it was something I, I left my job in 2022 and we had 200 units and, you know, we, it, it was, uh, just hard work, just focus on hard work, making systems better. And, uh, like I said, the money will follow if, as long as you're taking care of your investors. So, so hard work systems and take care of the investors. I think that's a great way to end it right there. So Glenn, Tell them where to find you anywhere, anywhere, you know, you, you know, Instagram podcast, where did the, where did the listening audience find you? So I might sound like an old man, but I'm on LinkedIn and, uh, I love LinkedIn and I like, um, the other one I'm, uh, is my podcast is the millionaire journey podcast. And I interview guys like, uh, James and, uh, all different types. We talk about real estate a lot and, uh, I have a hard time talking about 401ks so uh, we, I just tend to find guys that are in real estate. We just kind of go back and forth like like we're doing right now. And it's a lot of fun. I love it. I just added you on LinkedIn, by the way. Awesome. You're not, that, that's not an old thing. That's a, I'd see that all the multifamily guys are big on the LinkedIn. My, my posts on LinkedIn only get like two likes if I'm lucky. Really like five if I'm lucky. I see these multifamily guys like, yo, yeah, just syndicated a hundred apartments and like 500 likes, you know what I mean? So those are the cool guys on LinkedIn. You're probably one of the cool guys on LinkedIn is what I'm getting at. I've been too busy to post, but I, I, I'll say that it's going to start soon. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to, with everything now with you got, you know, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube Reels, LinkedIn. It's just, it's so much to post and keep up with. It's a lot, you know? Yep. Yeah. Well, Glenn, you're the man. I really appreciate your time. And um, thanks for coming on the J. Pilgrim Podcast. Thanks for having me. All right.